The film we started about making records in New Orleans has become, we're not sure really. But like most everything else, it's about the thing. The excitement is palpable. Our long, multi-jurisdictional nightmare is over. Or so we are to believe. We won't be rounding up much of last week's news and numbers today, because last week's news is pretty much all about this week, when Louisiana begins phase one of lifting restrictions on businesses. Endless stories of what kinds will be open how to safely patronize them. The media is uniformly optimistic, but cautionary. And caution is definitely advised, because the optimism about our grand reopening is based on us, all of us, doing the right thing and playing by the rules. And that's not our strong suit. We're a pretty freewheeling bunch here, with a well-earned reputation for tolerating behavior others won't. Ironically, that freedom and toleration could well derail our longed-for liberation from quarantine. Businesses that are allowed to reopen in the state include dine-in restaurants, bars that serve food, movie theaters, gyms, and shopping malls, with rules maintaining six feet between customers. Hair and nail salons may open, but not tattoo parlors. One parlor owner objected, stating correctly, that people in his industry already adhere to strict protocols to prevent infection the state was not that sympathetic. The problem with all of these establishments is that they're confined spaces where people stay for extended periods, exactly the environments proven most effective in spreading the virus. A decent hairstyling can take an hour. A tattoo can take all day or several days. And restaurant dining, however long or short, can't be done in a mask. Some businesses had better luck than the tattoo parlors in pushing back against the state. The powerful gaming industry was able, hours before state regulations were announced, to double the number of machines and game tables they might operate after reopening, from 25% to half of machines in the casino. The Hollywood Casino in Baton Rouge has over a thousand slot machines, meaning as many as 500 people playing, shouting, laughing in the same room, more or less right next to each other, really, for as long as they want to stay. Thankfully, New Orleans Mayor Cantrell has wisely decided that the city's casinos and video poker rooms will remain closed for now. But that doesn't mean you can't gamble in New Orleans. The number of COVID cases continues to rise in Louisiana, and the number of deaths, though fewer than last month, remains stubbornly steady. The coronavirus is everywhere in Louisiana, as ubiquitous as Bark's root beer once claimed to be. People think it can only travel as fast as a droplet of spit in the air. But in truth, it can go as fast as a car down the interstate, filled with happy customers headed to their favorite reopened New Orleans restaurant. But enough about life and death. Let's talk about art.
As with food and music and fashion, the freedom that New Orleans offers inspires a lot of creativity in art, especially street art. While we have our share of pointless scribblers, muralists and other street artists have graced the city with some undeniable masterpieces. After the flood of 2005, the elusive English graffiti artist Banksy did a series of pieces depicting the city's trials in the flood and its aftermath, and even got in a couple of digs at anti-graffiti vandal Fred Radke, notorious in the city for defacing owned, contracted murals as well as stray tags. Banksy's post-Katrina work drew wide notice in the art world including interest from some less-than-legit collectors. Our present calamity has sparked an explosion of creativity among the city's street artists, seeking to document the time and its emotional impact. When the mayor issued her stay-at-home order in March, the French Quarter quickly became a plywood forest, and street artists stepped right up. The Plywood NOLA project is a fundraising effort to offer local artists grants for time and materials to decorate window plywood. When the covered businesses reopen, the murals will be collected for a gallery show later in the year. The Frenchman Street Entertainment District got its share of plywood too, which brought out artists like Lionel Milton and Josh Wingerter decorating panels which quickly started generating interests among collectors and others. On Friday night, someone splattered paint over the Frenchman Street murals in what appeared to be an act of pointless vandalism. From the graffiti culture of the 1970s and 80s, probably from Pompeii or Lascaux, it's been considered offensive to paint over or slash another artist's work, though it's sometimes grudgingly accepted if the new work is superior to the original tag. One of the city's more notable street pieces is itself a slash over a slash. In 2016, Los Angeles graffiti artist Muck Rock painted a mural of five U.S. presidents, including Andrew Jackson, based on their currency portraits. Local residents were upset at the mural, and one or more artists painted over the presidents with roses. The following year, another artist covered the entire piece with a rendition of a $20 bill featuring abolitionist Harriet Tubman. The Tubman 20 is now something of a landmark, widely acknowledged as the better piece. That's not at all what happened on Frenchman Street. The splattered paint added nothing to the works and likely destroyed the value of the paintings, some of which had apparently already been sold. On Sunday, artist Amesy Adams posted pictures of one of his vandalized pieces and surveillance videos from the shop where it had hung. Neighborhood residents recognized the vandals, and by day's end, graffiti artist Stephen Buczynski confessed publicly on social media, saying that he had added to the other artist's work with tears. It's not clear at this time what the consequences will be for Mr. Buczynski, but it's doubtful that his additions will be seen as improvements by the artists. While Mr. Bochinski's actions may seem unrelated to the post-quarantine reopening of our city, they are an analogy for why we may not be ready for it. One person with a stupid idea and the freedom to pursue it ruined hours of work done by others, which was meant to be enjoyed by all. And that's quite likely what's going to happen with our much ballyhooed reopening. Some numbskull, probably more than a few, will decide that the rules are for other people and that they should have the freedom to act as they please. And the weeks of work done by all of us, staying at home, wearing masks, 
limiting contact. The sacrifices we made to keep hospital beds open for others will be thrown away as the curves climb upward again. We're thinking of taking a brief break from making these films. Not that there won't be news or numbers to report, but the regular media will supply those, along with pictures of happy diners and shoppers with perfect hair and nails. The real story of our grand reopening won't be known for another two weeks. For now, we thought it might be wiser to lay low for a week or so. And besides, with the streets full of people again, how are we going to get these shots? Please, wherever you live, have a thought for others. Wear a mask. Mind your distance. Your story and the stories of those around you is being written right now by you. Until next time, we wish you good health and good friends. Thank you.